I am trying to find something here. Hang on. I, I tweeted recently. Um, it's funny, isn't it? Ten years ago, people didn't tweet, did they? Did they? I mean, if they did, they were discouraged, weren't they? People would say, <laughs> would say what was that? Do you mind not doing that, please? Were people trying to eat in here. But uh, I, I tweeted about, uh, ask people if they are doing now. Well, let me ask you, how many of you now are doing with your life exactly what you thought you'd be doing when you were at school? There we go. So, I mean, you, know, you might be in a field of work that you had in mind. You know, you might have agreed you want to be a dentist, and you are. But this life, the things you've actually done, I mean, most lives are very circuitous, and um, you can only really make sense of them retrospectively. So I tweeted, and I said to people, what are you doing? And did you expect it? And this guy said, uh, uh, I'm an MSc in civil engineering, work with Unilever in marketing, co-founded a tech startup, and now I work in education. The other one said, I studied business communication. I'm now a professional magician. <laughs> and I dabble in linguistics. I studied politics and now work in football, so no change there. <laughs> this one I like this. Um, I had a lifetime in theatre, and I now run a Dutch cheese shop in the Scottish Highlands. <laughs> does that count? Well, well it, it does. Because that's the way it is, isn't it? You create your life as you go through it. It's why you don't need permission to have it. And Dan, our next speaker, was born in Liverpool. I just like this as an example of this, this uh, circuitous route. He took law in Cambridge, but then decided to refocus his career around technology, earning an MSc in software engineering from Liverpool University. He was recently with the global ad firm, uh, Whedon and Kennedy, and his family in here now based in Portland, Oregon. As the night follows the day. That's how it works, isn't it? <laughs> And he's here to talk about the role of empathy in technology and design. So please welcome Dan. Come Thanks very much, Ken. Um, yeah, so the idea that I want to talk to you about today is this thing that I've been thinking about for a while called the empathy gap. Um, but first, a little bit of a background about me. Um, I'm Dan. Um, Unlike what Ken says, I wasn't actually born in Liverpool. Um, I'm very, very sorry to everyone here who um, I have inadvertently offended by not being born here. Um, I was actually born in Bath, and then my parents are in the front row. Hi, Mum and Dad. Um, my parents are academics, so we moved all around the UK, um, and then we eventually settled um, on the Wirral in West Kirby, um, where um, I went to school, where I went to secondary school. And... I did have that circuitous path. I thought, you know, so I, I watched LA Law when I was growing up, um, late night on Channel 4, I think, and then, um, and then latterly, um, Ali McBeal, I think, um, and then got it into my head, of course, yes, um, I, want to inv I want the future of my life to be um, a soap opera, um, which is why I should go study law at university, um, where I, whereupon I learned that, actually, for the first two years of law, what you're really doing is learning how to operate a photocopier. Um, but be billed out at an extremely high rate. Um, and what I ended up doing was I've always been interested in games and storytelling, video games, play, all of that kind of stuff, and, and really, really great storytelling. And through a bizarre series of events that I think we're all kind of learning today is just how life happens, um, I ended up joining a startup and then founding another startup with my brother, um, Adrian, who opened up uh, TEDx this morning. Um, and, um, and then over the last three, four years, I've recently been working at an advertising agency. I decided to take the jump. Um, an opportunity came up that I thought I couldn't really turn down. Um, and then I went out and joined this ad agency. So unlike my brother, who this morning was kind of pretty much telling us to fight the power, for the last four years, I've been working pretty much for the man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Ken wins his bet again, and we are very, very different people. <laughs> um, and at my time at Wyden Kennedy, I've been working for clients like Facebook, uh, Nike, Coca-Cola. And what's been really interesting out there has been learning from this amazing advertising agency that's able to create incredibly powerful communication. How do they do that? How do they inspire their creative teams, and how do they help their clients 
achieve those kind of business goals that they've got, uh, telling you to just do it while at the same time getting you to buy these really quite cool shoes by <laughs> Nike. Um, so by way of some background, um, I've always been super interested in the medium of games. You know, it's changed so much in the last 10 to 15 years. It's evolved from this stereotype of you know, teenagers playing first-person shooters over the internet and shooting each other in the face while calling each other fag, which unfortunately still happens, all the way through to this amazing lifestyle photography, which is obviously what everyone who buys a Nintendo DS looks like, and they kind of don't really know how to use it properly. <laughs> Maybe it's some kind of javelin game. Um, all, all the way through to this, so one of the really amazing things that happened that kind of unlocked video games as a creative medium, as a, as a medium for expression and as a medium for play that was socially acceptable was a consequence of a thing in technology called Moore's Law. So Moore's Law says that roughly 18 months or so, the number of transistors that we can fit in a chip doubles. It's what means that, it's what means, uh, it's the reason why when the space shuttle Atlantis launched in 1991, it had one megabyte of RAM in it and why the phone in your pocket has two gigabytes of RAM in your pocket. It's that type of change. So, you know, the big thing that happened with Moore's Law was that it meant that instead of everyone just having a phone in their pocket, they pretty much ended up having the equivalent of a supercomputer super in their pocket. And it's a lot more socially acceptable to own a phone than it is perhaps to own a video game console in your pocket, but we know how much everyone likes or liked playing Angry Birds or Clash of Clans or whatever game it is that you're into at the moment, or Flappy Bird, for example. Um, and sometimes, you know, it sometimes gets to really, really annoy us um, in a way that some games could have been incredibly addictive back in the day. This is a particularly frustrated user playing Farmville on Facebook. <laughs> But then apparently people will always find a way to express their, their creativity. <laughs> um, but then at the same time, um, storytelling has been getting better and better as well. So at the same time, you know, while we've had the medium of games become more and more accepted by people in general, by Western culture, you know, despite what media might have to say about it, our capacity for storytelling has been improving. And I think some of the best, for example, TV series, films, novels, the great thing about the internet has been that um, it's allowed a platform for people, no matter what type or level or kind of creativity that they've got, to be able to reach that audience. And that's something that's amazing, that no matter what any kind of government might want to try, you just cannot put that back in the bottle. And something like that is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think... The thing to remember about that is that success of that storytelling, you know, all the people, everyone from people writing Twitter poetry up into Harry Potter fan fiction to Fifty Shades of Grey, all of that kind of stuff, these are examples of regular people who might not have considered themselves or been told that they were creative, but finding a way to connect emotionally with an audience. And I think that kind of thing is incredibly amazing and incredibly powerful. And, you know, so this is the bit where I get to say, and obviously, you know, we do that um, at ad agencies for money to help clients sell their products. Um, and sometimes we get to do some fun stuff. So this is the bit where I get to show you one of the things that I worked on earlier this year for Facebook, which you'd think wasn't a kind of company that needed to advertise itself, given that over a billion people use it. But um, one of the things that we were working on for them was they have a bit of a problem about being trusted and people not really knowing what they're for. Um, but in any event, we had a bit of fun making this. Facebook. <laughs> That's why we had to make a lot of them, because that one only nearly did it. Um, 
So all of that, all of that is background. And, and at the beginning of this, I titled this The Empathy Gap, and I promised you a big gap. Um, and I think the reason why I've started noticing what I'm calling this empathy gap is kind of a confluence of three different things coming together. So right now, we're living in a world that, um, where it's incredibly easy to put together very complex systems. Um, about 10 years ago, we used to talk about the internet as if it were a web of pages. So we would take some information and we would publish it. And then there would be a page here and there'd be a page there and there'd be a page there. And the thing that was awesome about the internet back then was we could link from one page to another page to another page. Uh, the society and the world that we live in right now is much more full of interconnected data and interconnected complex systems. And it's very, very easy to kind of set up in a way that we don't really fully understand or don't transparently understand or communicate to other people how complex those systems are. For example, when the financial system crashed, um, everyone was trying to sit around trying to figure out what all of the derivatives that everyone else had invented actually meant. Because someone somewhere had kind of done this with an Excel spreadsheet for a bit and gone, ta-da, a billion dollars. Um, and then you do control C, control V, and then you paste that for a few times. And you grab the little corner of the cell and you go like that. And then you fill up the spreadsheet and then you go home for the day and you get your bonus. Um, so it's very, very easy for us now because of the way that we've structured information in our society for us to create incredibly complex systems. And I think just because we're human beings, it's very easy for us to not speak up and to just kind of go along with it and say, okay, well, you know, if you say that works, fine. I will buy into the logistic system of Tesco where I don't really know what I'm buying is coming from or whether it's got horse in it or not. And at the same time, you know, we want to apply scale to everything. It's easier now than ever before to make something and go, I want to do this for a million people. No, wait, five million people, 10 million people. I want to be as big as WhatsApp were. I want to sell for $20 billion. I want to do something that has massive, massive effect. I want to be big quickly. And all of this, I think, is empowered in part because of all of this change in technology, all of this stuff in Moore's Law, which means that uh, more and more people are getting connected. It's just going to happen. These phones are going to get cheaper. More, they're going to get more affordable. All the data is going to get more affordable and all of that stuff. And I think what all of this means is that because it's easier to build these types of systems, it's easier to be more disconnected from the people who are actually using them. And I think that's what I mean by this idea of an empathy gap. It's what I mean by the idea of being, thinking that you can put something out there into the universe. So something like a product like Google Glass. Who's heard of Google Glass here? OK. Um, who doesn't like Google Glass here? OK. Slightly fewer people. Um, the idea of Google Glass is inherently and sometimes atavistically uh, repulsive to some people because ultimately part of the idea is you have just strapped a camera to your face and I don't know if it's on or not. <laughs> and some people see that as socially intrusive and maybe a bit rude. Um, but when you're gunning to change the world, you don't particularly care what other people think. And this is what I'm trying to get at with this idea of the empathy gap is stopping for a moment and really listening to what users or what regular people are going to do with the technology or the product or the service and how they're going to react to it. So here's a couple of examples. So one of the big things right now in tech and design is um, how technology is going to fix healthcare. Technology is going to fix diabetes. Technology is going to do all of this for us. It will do this through things like our new phones. Apple is going to release a new phone in September that's going to have all these amazing sensors in it. I'm wearing an activity bracelet right now, a Nike fuel band that tracks my movement all the time. Um, and the way that these devices work is right now they are for, I think I'm quite happy to say, um, really geeky people who like numbers. Um, because the whole idea behind them is they measure things. And then they display them to you in dashboards, uh, dashboards like this. Um, I don't know what this means, but it looks cool. <laughs> oh, it means 26 runs, 50 climbs, 847,000 steps that this person is. Is that good? I don't know if that's good or not. I don't know if this is good or not. I don't have the context behind it. 
There's an impulse to say, well, we're going to fix this, we'll measure it, and then we'll display that back to you. And we'll even display it in an ambient way, because ambient sounds more approachable and more humane. But ambient, in this sense, means we're just going to put the numbers everywhere. Every, we'll, put them in your, we'll put them in your mirror when you wake up in the morning while you're brushing your teeth. We'll put them in your car while you're driving. We'll put them in your phone. Um, we will make it so easy for you to measure your blood pressure every single day that you will probably make your blood pressure grow up. <laughs> and all of this, I think, is because of a failure in empathy, a failure to connect with um, the actual audience, to connect with the actual needs of the people using the technology. We see it also in um, inflexible algorithmic decision-making, uh, more commonly known as computer says no. Um, we've made it so much easier to hide behind the algorithm. Um, the algorithm is becoming a catch-all um, response to, well, something bad happened. Well, it's because, we com it's because the computer decided that that's what would happen. And it turns out, actually, that computers don't program themselves. <laughs> we program them. Uh, hundreds of engineers work at Facebook and define that algorithm. And they decide what that algorithm should favor. So they don't get to step back and say, oh, well, yes, the algorithm decided what should be at the top of your newsfeed. No, they decided. They program the algorithm, and then the algorithm decides. Drone operators put the data into a drone, and then the drone executes the algorithm that was designed by humans. That's what we mean by hiding behind an algorithm. Ultimately, we are the ones programming all of these machines. Um, here's one example, I think, of something that's gone well that I quite like. So in the US, there was a Supreme Court case. AT&T um, changed their terms of service in the United States. Um, you, know those, you know when you sign up for a mobile phone contract and then you get like 20 pages? Or when you sign up to a new website and it says, you must accept our terms of services. And then they're like 180 pages long. So the things no one ever agrees to or reads that they just click yes to. AT&T snuck a clause in there that said, uh, by agreeing to these terms of services, you agree that you can't sue us anymore. You agree that you will um, agree to arbitration, uh, which is like suing us, but not really a lot cheaper for us. And anyway, you probably won't win when you go into arbitration with us. Arbitration is a lot more friendly for us. Arbitration also takes away your right to perform a class action lawsuit against us. Um, and the Supreme Court said, you know what? Yes, AT&T can do that. But they have to allow you to opt out. How do you think companies who took use of this new court decision allow you to opt out? You have to write them a letter. Because, you know, they're, they're a mobile phone company. Um, you have to write them a letter, and then they might get it. Uh, they won't ring you back if they did get it. They won't write to you if they got it. It just goes somewhere. So you have no idea. So the opposite of that is something like this. This is a service called Dropbox. Um, quite a lot of people here probably use it. You can use it to just store your files online. They did a similar thing. They said, well, you know, everyone else is doing it. We're going to do this whole um, opt-out of arbitrate, opt out um, into um, class action stuff and do arbitration as well. And um, instead of requiring you to write a letter to just some address in some random location, um, they decided, you know what? We think people might actually want to opt out. We're going to create a form for this. So we're going to make this easy for people because we've decided bluntly not to be dicks about it. <laughs> and that, I think, is the really big thing. So there's. I think, ultimately, technology doesn't have to be dehumanizing. <laughs> this is a really, really scary photo. This is the future that we could all have if Robert Scoble, who's a technologist, gets his Google Glass and says that he will go into bathrooms. And um, honest to God, he's not going to film you in the bathroom. Um, there's two examples that I think are really good that are worth learning from. One is a company called Zappos. They have a fanatical devotion to customer service. I think the best example of it is when you go to their website and you try to order a pair of shoes and they don't have them, they go and find out where they're available and they say, go buy them from that store instead. Because they understand that your problem right then is getting those shoes. 
and that you want those shoes and that you will come back to Zappos next time because they helped you get done the job that you needed to get done. And then the other thing, I think there's an organization that's, do, that's doing some fantastic work right now, which is the Government Digital Service um, in the UK, which is all about creating better digital services. Their mantra is about creating services so good that people um, will prefer to use them. And they've done a fantastic job uh, with uh, the main government website. But they have this one thing. I'm just going to leave you with this one image. So they have this taped up in one of their offices at Whitehall, and it's a cutout, and it just captions people in the street. And it says, these are who our users are. They're just regular people. That's who we're designing for. We're not designing for faceless people. We're designing for regular people. Just anyone you might see out in the street. So if there's anything um, that I'd like you to take from my talk today, it's that if there's anything we can do together to close this empathy gap, then I think that would be absolutely wonderful. Thanks very much. Thank you.